before we start, I'd just like to uh, just talk about a little bit about the company uh, because I believe what you said is absolutely correct. I mean, Novatech is such a unique story coming out of Russia. It's, a, it's essentially it's a greenfield developed company. It wasn't one of the big privatized oil companies. Uh, we have a, about little over about 9.3 billion barrels of oil equivalent under the SEC reserves, uh, 15.4 billion under the uh, what we call PRMS. Uh, we have we have roughly about 42 billion barrels of oil equivalent unbooked reserves. Our gas is primarily wet, um, which is which is you know obviously the big thing today in the market. Uh, we've been more or less the pioneers in Russia in terms of developing the whole wet gas infrastructure, including the exports of, uh, of a stable gas condensate out of Russia. Um, we're considered a low cost producer, have been ever since we started. It's been kind of the core, you know, cornerstone of our operations is uh, given that we always had a, a relatively low domestic gas price in Russia, we've been able to build up uh, fairly strong metrics and it was uh, predicated on essentially having a low cost structure. This is more or less what we did since we went public in 2005. We increased our reserves uh, or through the, what we call the organic or drill bit uh, by 52%. Uh, like I said, we have about 41 years of reserve life under the P2 and 2023 20, under P1. Uh, in terms of what are some of the metrics that I mentioned before, when we look at the reserve replacement cost, which is an all in metric, Novatech is considered to be one of the lowest cost, if not the lowest cost producer in the world. Uh, what we try to do is, is benchmark ourselves against a series of, of, of energy companies that more or less have the same sort of characteristics. So we kind of exclude a lot of the Russian companies because it's really the only one we have of any, any stature would be Gazprom who don't report this type of information. Um, so we have a, a, a select peer group. And you can see I'm, I'm waiting for the, the, the 2009-2011 peer group numbers come out. Um, we get that from publicly uh, reported statistics, but just look at the numbers. You can see we've averaged about a dollar, dollar, dollar ten, a dollar twenty per barrel of oil equivalent to find, acquire, and develop our resource base, which gives us a huge competitive advantage over our over our peer group. Last year we replaced 597 percent over three years in terms of our reserves, and again we have a, a fairly almost double the industry average for our, our sort of reserve life. Kind of kind of hurts us a little bit on valuation because it obviously has an impact on the net present value of the company, but nonetheless, it's nice to have these long life reserves that are available to, to produce. This kind of just shows you a little bit about what we've done since we went public. Uh, we held a fairly uh, lengthy strategy presentation in December here in London, and we kind of went back and showed everybody what we did in terms of what we promised we would do and what do we deliver. Uh, as a basis of saying, well, this is what we plan to do uh, going forward to 2020, which is really will be the basis of the, or, or more of the core of what I'll talk about today. But in terms of production, we started out with zero uh, barrels of oil equivalent, and today we're producing about 1.2, 1.3 million barrels of oil equivalent per day, of which about 90% of that is considered natural gas and 10% is liquids. So some, some fairly uh, aggressive growth, growth rates. Um, the core of our operations is what we call the Yohovskoy field. It's a very, very prolific gas structure in the Yamal Nets region, northern Siberia. It's essentially a field um, that last year was, uh, was voted the best gas development field in Eastern Europe. Uh, you can see from the, the chart that it's also been a fairly rapidly growing uh, operations where it represents approximately about 60% of our production today and it's almost at a point of reaching its plateau. It's just a question of do we want to continue drilling additional wells to expand the field's operation or cap it at about 37, 38 billion cubic meters. We'll reach, we'll reach that level by the fourth quarter this year. The reserves kind of migrate a little bit out to the, uh, to the what we call the Ob River, uh, or excuse me, this is Tazo Bay, the Tazo Bay area over here. And what, it, what essentially happens is that they're generally big bore long horizontal wells. And what we try to do is, is show everybody why the productivity for flow rates are, are pretty, pretty substantial. What we, we're generally talking about, we're talking about going down about 3,000, 4,000 meters deep on a vertical well, and then anywhere from about 1,000 to 2,000 feet, or excuse me, meters, excuse me, 
on, on a horizontal and we use multi, multi perforated zones to reach across the whole condensate level. So we're able to, to substantially increase the flow rates and the average flow rate uh, from this particular field is about, um, about 35 MCF a day uh, to as high as 170 MCF a day. And, it, and they're some of the world's largest gas producing fields according to our petroleum engineers, DeGoyer and McNaughton. Um, but this has been a core, again, we, we, we don't have to drill a substantial number of wells to substantially increase production, uh, but the wells on average cost about $12 million to complete. Uh, we generally pay those fields back in about 70 days for the 30, for the 170 type production wells and about 300 plus days for those at about 35. So they're, they're pretty prolific, long life resources. In our strategy presentation, what we basically said we're going to do, we're going to double our production of natural gas by 2020 and triple our liquid production over the same corresponding period of time. What we more or less wanted to talk about at that particular point in time in terms of the strategy is that I think everybody was relatively comfortable with the core operations, meaning the Yaharskoy field, the East Tarkasolinskoy field, and the Hunchaiskoy field. Um, we talked a little bit about what we would produce in the next one to three years, and then we went a little further and looked at what we would produce, you know, five to seven years, get us closer to the end of the decade. And we kind of broke those down into two different colors, which you see like the, the gray and the purple. Um, the gray area is, is more or less a field. Uh, it, we acquired an asset in uh, November 2010. It was a Severa Energia or Northern Energy. Um, we have a 25 and a half percent interest in it. It's a very large gas field, gas, it's gas, wet gas field. Um, at peak production, it's going to produce about 37 billion cubic meters and about 11 million tons per annum of wet gas production. Um, one of the unique things about this particular field operations uh, is that the license area, basically, our, our infrastructure transverses through the license area, and we've been able to use the existing infrastructure, such as our pipelines and our processing facilities, to, to more or less get production on stream pretty rapidly. So first production just occurred on the 22nd of, uh, of April this, this year, and we plan to add another train by the end of the year. So we plan to have a fairly rapid growth over the next two to three years in terms of production profile from the uh, seven energy fields. Um, again, a massive gas structure right in the core of the existing infrastructure. So it's easy for us to, to process it and also to bring it on stream in the marketplace. So as we start moving forward, what we're, we're going to essentially be doing is moving further north into a, a couple of geographical regions that are generally new. Um, the Yamal Peninsula, which is the heart of our LNG production, um, that's to, on the map, that's to the, to the left side. Um, the core asset that we'll be developing is called the South Tambayskoy field. Uh, that's going to be the feedstock. It's about a 30 billion cubic meter field. It's going to be the feedstock for our Yamal LNG project, which we plan to launch towards the end of 2016, beginning of 2017. Uh, Yamal LNG, um, presently we own 80% and Total has a 20% stake. Um, the three fields, the West Tambe, the North Tambe, and the Tazasquia field, were recently announced a joint venture with Gazprom, where Gazprom will contribute those particular licenses into this joint venture. They will own 75%, Novatech will have a 25% stake, and we'll use the existing infrastructure that's being built for the, for the um, Umal LNG project. It will be additional LNG capacity expected to be produced on the continent, but it, it's gonna be using the existing infrastructure, and you'll be able to see that a little better on the, on the next map. The blue license areas was something that we acquired uh, towards the latter part of, of last year from, the, from a tender by the Russian Federation. Um, these resources, again, are, are fairly prolific in, in, a, in, a, in a, an area which there's a high probability of, of recoveries of a significant amount of gas. Um, and combined are about 20 billion barrels of oil equivalent. They're broken down into two sections. The bottom two licenses, which is the Geophysica and the uh, Uternay licenses, under the Russian reserve classification, they're considered uh, C1, C2, which is like proved improbable. Um, the North Ob and the East Tambayskoy are more what we would consider to be resources and are what's categorized in Russia as D1 reserves and need a little more of activity. But the plan is to build a pipeline straight down south 
to the Amber compressor station, and we will connect into Gazprom's major infrastructure, use that facility to bring gas back onto the Russian domestic market. First production is expected to be uh, around 2017, 2018 for the two lower basins. And we've also contributed uh, another joint venture with Gazprom that was also announced on the same day, where we're gonna contribute the Uthrene field into this joint venture and retain a 50% stake, and Gazprom will get a 50% stake in the field. But the key element is that we will not have to incur the infrastructure-related costs to build a pipeline. That would be built and the cost will be borne by Gazprom. But as you can see on this particular chart, it's about 30 billion cubic meters of natural gas and about 1.3 million tons of liquids coming on stream about 2017 and 2018 at a cost of about $6 billion. The, the other interesting element of this particular license area, when we start developing the Gudan Peninsula, it allows and an infrastructure is built. There's a whole bunch of licenses in the south part of this peninsula that are owned by the state that we expect that they'll tender pretty soon. Um, both ourselves and Gazprom have been more or less designated as the two companies that will develop the gas resources on the Amal and Gudan Peninsulas. And just an interesting statistic, when we look at going further to the Arctic Circle, essentially the U.S. Geological Service basically said about 20% of the undiscovered oil and about 30% of the undiscovered reserves reside in the, in the Arctic Circle, of which 75% of the oil undiscovered oil and 90% of the undiscovered gas reside in the Russian continental shelf. So it's very, very important when we talk about the development activity that we know that is highly prospective and they attach almost 100% probability to our ability to find reserves and, and monetize them. Now go a little bit to the Amal LNG project because this is kind of a, like a transformational uh, project for the company because this now takes us from being purely a domestic gas producer to one that will be exporting LNG from Russia. Um, I think yesterday there was an announcement that the Stockman project was dissolved. Uh, the partner, the Stockman Development Company, I, I'm sure we'll probably read about it more in the next couple days. Um, but I believe that the government support so far has been more, more or less earmarked to this particular project. And it's gonna be built in three trains to five million tons per annum. Uh, first train is expected to be launched by the end of 2016. Um, the facility, as you see in sort of this 3, 3D, uh, three-dimensional graph, is essentially going to be an infrastructure that's more or less funded by the Russian government. It will be used by other companies. It will be used by Ross Neft and its joint ventures, Gazprom Neft and its uh, uh, offshore Arctic, Arctic activities. So the facility, the infrastructure that's being built by the government will be shared by, by a few different companies, not just Novatech. Um, we've just finished the feed study, and the feed study basically confirmed that the cost was about 20, roughly about $20 billion for, the, for our share of the activity, and about $13 billion will be committed by the Russian government. On the South Tamboisco field, it's about, again, 25 billion cubic per annum, 1.4 million tons uh, of, of condensate. And what I said to you before is that if you look at the field structure, the Porta Sabeta is where the actual LNG complex will be built. It's right in the heart of our, our operations. That's why I was saying before that when we look at sharing these additional LNG capacity with Gazprom is that they'll use this particular facility as part of the uh, you know, additional LNG that we expect to be produced and sold off of the Amal Peninsula. Our, 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 our belief is today that the Amal Peninsula will be the heart of Russian LNG and the heart of the Arctic LNG coming out of this particular region. There's um, just a little bit on the field. We've already drilled 58 um, exploration wells, so the field is well defined. Um, it's what we call the uh, Valanginian layer gas. It's about, again, three to 4,000, 5,000 meters deep. It's wet gas. It's more or less in, in line with the operations we're doing today. Um, so we're very comfortable in Sabeta. We've already done a, a series of activities in terms of um, building out the facility. And so we've already connected four production wells into the power plant that we built, uh, heating system. We also built in housing complex, warehousing facilities, and we've already started some of the activity going on in terms of beginning the dredge. In terms of the field development, We've also uh, have already uh, contracted with a, a company called Euromash in Russia. They built the first of the Arctic rig. It's already on site. 
Uh, the second one is being fabricated right now. So we plan to actually start doing development drilling in, in April of, uh, of 2013. Um, what we did on, based on the, the, the work to date, we more or less have stretched out and changed the development program where we're going to bring on stream wells at a, at a longer period of time. And by doing that, that means that we can save significant amount of cost on the number of rigs we're going to build. We're going to build eight, five instead of eight and also the number of, of drilling pads from, uh, from 35 down to 20. So this is, this is basically more or less the development plan. And like I said, we'll start drilling activity in, in April 2013. Um, Novatech has also been very successful, for, for those who don't know. Um, we were the first company ever to deliver hydrocarbons to the North and Sea route of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, we did that in 2010 where we sent the first tanker of, 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 of stable gas condensate through this particular region uh, during the navigable season, which is generally from May, June to uh, October, November. And we were able to bring it to the um, China, Port of Nimba in China. And what it confirmed to us is that we can use the Northern Sea Route and it reduces the nautical distance by 50% as well as the time by 50%. Um, and that was confirmed when our first vessel went in 2010. Last year in 2011, we sent nine vessels through this particular region, again, confirming the numbers that we had in terms of the logistical side of it. Um, so what this done, it, it, it essentially means that we can, during this navigable period, move LNG off to the Asian Pacific market, and, and then the period of time when we can't travel through this because of the ice zones, et cetera, we go through the traditional Gibraltar, Mediterranean, down the Suez Canal, up through the Strait of, uh, of Malacca to the Asian particular market. This has also been, you know, clearly demonstrating that given this capability of delivery, we can also look at various swap opportunities with the Qataris in terms of swapping out uh, LNG going to the Asian Pacific market with cargoes going to, to uh, the Europe. So the, um, th this is more or less our logistical strategy um, and also you can see from this particular, we plan to be setting up uh, an operations in Singapore pretty soon. Uh, we've already set up a trading group in, in Europe. It's based in Zug, Zug, excuse me, Zug, Switzerland. It's called Novatech Gas and Power. We are looking at uh, potentially uh, starting some early trading activities. So we're looking at maybe potentially long, locking up some, some contracts before the end of the year to start, start trading in LNG and particularly maybe even pipeline gas. Um, but we're, we're breaking out, more or less, from being a domestic producer focused on the Russian domestic market, and that's why I alluded to earlier, it's kind of a transformational project for us. One of the main barriers we had to overcome was the shipping side. And one of the things that were always one of the issues and, you know, sort of technical challenges that were presented to us is whether or not we're able to deliver cargoes given the ice nature in, in the Arctic Circle, and what we did we looked at existing operations of Luke Oils at the Varangai port. We looked at Naril Snickel and what they're doing at Dodinka and movement through the Barents Sea. We worked with uh, Acre Arctic and essentially had two ice basin tests confirm that the tanker proposed, which has now been called the Yamal class ARC-7 tanker, is navigable through the Kara Sea all winter, all season long, and it can, it can travel at 19 and a half nautical knots in unencumbered ice-free water and at five and a half nautical knots in one and a half meter deep ice. So we're pretty comfortable that the ships that, we, that were designed will be able to transit all year round. This is an area, just for your understanding, this is part of the $13 billion that the Russian government is invested in to build up and this will be constructed by Sofcom Flot and leased back to Novatech on long-term charter leases. Uh, the Port of Sabeta is essentially a couple of challenges that we had to overcome. Uh, we have a, 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 a dredging project that needs to be undertaken. We're going to do about 35 nautical miles at the mouth of the, the Ob River and about five nautical miles by the, by the loading facilities. The dredging material will be used to backfill what we call a seawall. And the seawall, it's, it's like an ice protection wall, and it's not to stop, just so to declare, it's not going to stop the ice, but what it does is going to be used to deflect ice away from the, from the loading dock. So that's one of the challenges, because the ice is moving in a particular area when it starts breaking up. And one of the things we wanted to make sure that when the ships are berthed 
you know, we're not going to have constant crashing of ice against the ships, and the seawall will more or less divert this ice away from them uh, to a large extent. It's probably not going to be a, a total 100% solution, but at least it, it solved one of the major challenges we had in terms of, 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 of ice movements. Uh, this is Novatech's forecast when we look at the market, both on the domestic side and, and you know, when we look at the exports. So we look at the demand and supply side. Um, clearly, Novatech's position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Russian domestic market is, is growing. Uh, we represent about 8% of the total production. Uh, we're, we expect by the end of the decade we'll be about 13%. We deliver over 50% of the non-gas uh, non prom related production into the, into the market today. Um, we're also shifting away, as you can see on the demand side, one of the key elements of the Yamal LNG project is that Russia feels that geopolitically or strategically on the gas market, Russia needs to participate in the LNG to some measurable degree, and so the Yamal project will serve as one of the platforms as well as the current LNG coming out of the Sakhalin Island projects and potentially additional what we call Far East, maybe at Vladivostok, until such time as eventually uh, Stockman project comes back on the board again. Just some of the regions, we, we, our primary regions in Russia, we, we, did, we, did, we deliver about 35 regions. There's about 10 plus primary regions. Um, what we try to outline is that we're taking over now, one of the key elements of our marketing strategy is we're taking over 100% of key geographical regions away from Gazprom where we're, we're the primary supplier. Um, what this does though for us, it means that our focus has always been delivering gas to, say, industrial clients. Now we go back and expand it out to not only industrial, but it gives us commercial, residential, et cetera. So by the end of the decade, you'll see that Novatech sales composition will be increasing to the residential side, meaning that we're going to have a, a, a significantly increased number of customers. So what we do is we basically have been going into the market and building out market and arms within key, key geographical regions in Russia. So that's basically it. It's an exciting story. Uh, it's one that, you know, like I said, we built up a world-class gas company. I mean, this past year, we jumped over BP in terms of reserves, and we're breathing down the, on the neck of our colleagues at Shell, and I, I'm pretty certain that by 2012, we'll leapfrog Shell also. And the plan by being 2020 is Novatech will be the second largest gas producer in the world. That's, that's after Gazprom. That's our plan. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark. Very uh, interesting. We're going to take questions from Mark now before we move on to the, the next panel, which is Caspian themes. So um, maybe I'll kick it off. For this massive CapEx for, well, for everything, but for Yamal LNG in particular, how is that going to be financed? Or is there some project financing of some components of it? Yeah, there's um, the, the project structure. I mean, first of all, we have 80% right now. The plan is to uh, further farm out an additional 29%. So if you look at, if we assume that the 29% does get farmed out and Novatech retains 51%, because by, by Russian law, uh, a Russian company owning a strategic asset must own 51%, uh, essentially what we're looking at is um, with the farmed in participants, there'll be a carried cost element. So given the initial investment, the disproportional financing by our particular partners, the project financing that you alluded to, which we're looking at probably in the range of seven to eight billion dollars in project financing. Uh, and, and then as we phase the project along the three particular stages, um, we're, we're expecting significant cash flow generation from those particular uh, phase approach. And based on that, for Novatech to retain a 51% stake in the entity, we have about 18% overall operational cost for the project. So from our perspective, it's, it's within our realm of our cash flow generation, but yes, there'll be a large portion of about seven to eight billion dollars of project financing. Okay. Good news for bankers and lawyers. Uh, That's absolutely. When, when is the farm out of the 29% plan to take place? Um, we're, we're in discussion right now. There's, there's no concrete date, um, you know, when the final announcements will be. Uh, I suspect that you may hear some positive news out of the St. Petersburg Forum. And, and the reason why I say you hear positive news out of the forum is generally it's always reserved for those types of events. And I think as we move forward 
to the FID decision, which is expected to occur by the end of this year, I think we're getting closer and closer to concluding some of these negotiations. But we're, we're basically looking at three, three key partners that are looking at the deal. Uh, Qatari Petroleum is interested in it, EDF out of France, and a consortium of four Indian companies, and, and we're basically at various stages in negotiations. Interesting. Okay, we have some hands going up, start in the back and then up to the front and then back to you. Uh, William Powell from Platts. Until recently, uh, Sovcom Flot was on the slate for privatization. Is that still thinking ahead? And if so, what will that mean for the government's contribution uh, to, the, to the project? Thank you. Uh, I can't answer in terms of Sovcom, whether it's privatized or not privatized. That's a question to the Ministry of Finance of Russia. Um, in, in respect to the, 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 the ships, uh, we know that Russia is extremely interested in kick-starting again uh, the shipping industry in Russia. Um, they're working with a consortium of companies out of Japan and Korea. Um, they've already identified and started working on a shipbuilding out in the Primorsky region in Vladivostok. And so we believe that you know, that will continue going forward. In terms of the, um, the nuclear icebreakers, which will also be required, and that's not held by uh, Sovcom Flot, that's Rosatom. We know by the various phase-out program that the government has already commissioned uh, a 75 megawatt nuclear icebreaker to start being built this year. So, I've, you know, in order to get this project on stream uh, by 20, end of 2016, you know, we have to make sure that the government is investing and we got assurances by the current administration that they are going to make that investment. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I'm Oleg Vukmanovic from Reuters. I was just wanted to ask about the uh, swap deal with Qatar. Can you say anything more about that in terms of um, how many cargoes and to which markets uh, Yamal would be supplying? What I, what I basically said, so we understand there's no misunderstanding here. I'm saying that it makes economic sense to look at the geographical distribution, particularly if the Qataris now know that we can reach their market in a very efficient time. Make our, make our cargo very cost competitive going into the Asian Pacific market. I'm just saying if you look at that map again of the world, you see that it makes economic sense for both partners because we can ship to Europe at a very reasonable cost and distance and everybody avoids going through volatile areas. So there's no, there's no agreement in place right now. I'm just saying is that's part of one of the, one of the key selling and marketing points for, for them in this particular type, type of transaction. Is that being discussed right now? Sorry, is that being discussed? Uh, right it's now? not going to really talk about specific details. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, in the back uh, left corner, please. Uh, Nick Coleman from Argus Media. Um, two questions, if I, if I may. Um, you mentioned that um, you are edging Gazprom out of domestic supply in a number of regions of Russia. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on, you know, why is, well, how that's happening, what's the mechanics of that, why, why would Gazprom, you know, why is that actually happening, what's, what's Gazprom's attitude to that? Um, and if, if I may also ask you to just elaborate, you, you referred to Stockman and seem to perhaps imply that uh, the project is basically dead or on hold indefinitely. Um, could you, if that's the case, could you explain why you think that might be? Is it because of there's just going to be enough gas in the Atlantic Basin area, or are there other reasons that you can uh, elaborate on why that might be not going forward? Thank you. Well, on, the, on the first question, um, it's more or less been even even if you look at Gazprom's longer term strategy, was clearly showing that they're giving up parts of the Russian domestic market. I mean, you know, that's clearly been going on over the years um, where you can see the trend where the independence, particularly Novatech, has increased its share vis-a-vis -vis the, the sort of the pie on the supply side in Russia. And, and when we look at, you know, if you, want to, if you want to really look at a, a very simple way to look at that, if you look at a, a pie that says, here's the supply side, traditionally you had Gazprom, the independence, and Central Asian imports coming in. And on the demand side, you had the Russian Federation, the former Soviet Union, and Western Europe. 
by the very nature of the demand, you, can, you saw automatically that gas pump was unable to meet all of its requirements in this particular market, hence the growth of the independence. I believe what's, what's changed not so much the strategy of Gazprom as I think a significant marker for us was when Turkmenistan built a pipeline and connected directly to China, kind of broke away this sort of geopolitical reason why you would pay you know, Central Asian countries a higher price than you would pay on the domestic market. So you take that away and you look at it from a pure economic perspective, it's clearly advantageous to continue buying gas or let the independents produce more and more gas on the Russian domestic market. And that's what I think you're seeing. You're seeing an absolute collapse in the number of, or volume of, of imports coming in from Central Asia, offset by the growth in the independent sector. In terms of specific geographical marketing areas, you know, Novatech sells almost 80% of our gas to the end consumer in the, pet, in the power generation sector. So what we've been doing, and been doing very well, is we've been penetrating certain, you know, sort of industrial regions, and the most recent one that we were able to uh, gain control of was, would be the Chelyabinsk region. And, you know, now, you know, we're pretty much the primary, primary supplier. So I think it's just an evolution of the Russian domestic market where Gazprom can't supply 100% to all these particular clients, customers, et cetera, both domestically and abroad, and the independents as ourselves have grown uh, correspondingly. And the second question, again, I, you know, it's really a question for Gazprom. I mean, it, it's hard to speculate. I mean, there's been rumors going on. There's been a lot of discussions on why the project's been delayed, why FID gets continually pushed back. This has only been announced yesterday. I'm sure there'll be more and more news flow coming out of, you know, why was the dissolution of the you know, uh, Stockman Development Company? You know, I, I, you know, you hear rumors about additional partners being changed and around, but I think that's a question that you really need to talk to Gazprom about. Okay. Any more? Okay, <laughs> back to the press. It's become a press conference. I'm sorry. Sorry, Joe. But no offense. Uh, it, are there any projects in which you're involved and in which uh, Gazprom isn't? I mean, there was talk before of Gazprom acting as an agent, handling your, your LNG exports because they have the export monopoly. Is, are there any projects which Gazprom isn't involved in, which, but which do envisage you exporting gas and which do require in, uh, some sort of involvement by Gazprom? Thank you very much. No, I mean, you're right. Gazprom, Gazprom has a monopoly on exports. And, you know, that hasn't changed. And it's a, a question that continuously gets raised by the investment community uh, on, on speculative news that there's potential changes in the export monopoly. And, and I basically try to caution everybody that that's not the case. And I, I do not see a breakup of Gazprom's export monopoly anytime in the near future. With that said, Mr. Putin has already commented a few times that, that you know, this is not forever. There is opportunity for independents to eventually gain exports uh, in the marketplace. Uh, I know that's kind of a, a summary of what he basically said. Um, but, you know, our LNG project will be a, a major opportunity for us to transform our company from a domestic producer to an export producer in terms of LNG. Doesn't mean we're going to get export rights on the pipeline <coughs> structure. So what I, what I basically have say to everybody is that the question of if has been removed is a question of when. And the question of when was when we'll start producing LNG in 20, end of 2016. A lot of people like to see it earlier, but I, you know, I caution you know, it's hard to speculate at this particular, particular point of whether or not we're going to get export rights on the pipeline. Very good. Okay, last question. I think we can run over on the next one, can't we? Okay, go ahead. One just, more question. Just, just a quick cool. question. So, so EML, uh, one option for LNG, Sakhalin, another. I, I'm just curious, a quick comparison between um, the extent to which Sakhalin and maybe a, a pipe option eastward uh, through Russia would compete against something like a Yamal. I mean, Yamal is not the only way to get gas to Asia. So I'm just wondering if you could quickly compare that. No, it's not the only way. It's, um, you know, the, the, advantage, the advantage of using the LNG it allows you to transport to various different markets. As you're well aware, everybody here, you know, 
gas, if you continue using pipeline structures, you basically more or less are regional. So yeah, there's been discussions about building a pipeline that transverses through Altai region of Russia into connected into the west east pipeline structure in China. You know, I, I've seen speculation and I've seen discussions of building a 4,500 roughly kilometer pipeline. Uh, so there is there is that opportunity, and I think I think eventually, you know, you may see that route go. Um, but there's still, I think, some um, environmental issues, et cetera, that, that need to be discussed on how close you get to Lake Baikal, et cetera. There's, there's been some kind of back push against, against building that pipeline. But if you do the pipeline structure, you clearly open up eastern Siberia. And, and I think that's more or less, I think, when you look at a pipeline structure in there, you're opening up particular, particular new basins of Russian production. But clearly right now, it looks like the focus of the LNG market and to be able to deliver to you know both Europe, South America, Asia Pacific, et cetera, is going to be done through the Yamal Peninsula and through Yamal LNG. Great. Okay. okay thanks thank very much. much.